I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, Ezra and Nehemiah with additional selections from Second Chronicles. Yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't just jump into Ezra and Nehemiah without going back and picking up just one story from First and Second Chronicles, and, and it's largely, if you read those two books, they're not covered in the Come Follow Me curriculum this year. First Chronicles has a lot of people mentioned, a lot of names. Second Chronicles actually throws in a couple of stories that you don't get anywhere else uh, expounded. So we wanted to grab at least just one story, and then we're going to jump into Ezra and Nehemiah. And, and just for your curiosity, First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, in some ways, follow very similar timelines, but are slightly different uh, scribal or editorial or inspired writers' perspectives. Kind of like the four Gospels, yeah. where you have four different people each expressing their testimony of Jesus. Sometimes in slightly different ways. And First and Second Kings seem to have been written by uh, people who had a northern uh, kingdom of Israel perspective, where First and Second Chronicles seems to have been primarily composed by people in the kingdom of Judah who were very, uh, very supportive of King David and his his dynasty. So it's just just some potential connections. Yeah. So in this particular chapter that we're going to cover, it's Second Second Chronicles chapter twenty you get this story of King Jehoshaphat, and as Taylor already mentioned, he's king of this southern uh, kingdom of Judah, well after the split between the northern and the southern tribes, and in this particular chapter you get the problem of Moab, Ammon, and others besides this group coming against Jehoshaphat to battle. So you get the Ammonites, the Moabites combining together to say, hey, let's, let's join forces and go in and attack Jehoshaphat in his capital city of Jerusalem, and others. So Mount Sire is going to join the, the coalition of forces against the kingdom of Judah in this chapter. I want you to, to pay attention early on to Jehoshaphat's experience here in the face of great adversity and great opposition. Look at verse 3, and Jehoshaphat feared. So most of you would pause there and go, oh, so, so he's afraid. This, this is um, a, a negative thing. But if you keep reading, it says, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Even if you use our current definition of the word fear, the reality is, is wow, this guy did a good job of overcoming that fear because the very next thing he did was he set himself to seek the Lord. But if you use the, the covenantal context of this word, as Taylor's uh, mentioned in previous episodes, that fear isn't just of what these people are going to do, it's a reverential respect for God and a recognition that, ah, I got problems, I can't solve them, but I know somebody who can help me. And so he goes to the Lord, seeking the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. I think that's an important principle for us to, to recognize is that here you get a leader, King Jehoshaphat. There, there are so few of the kings in ancient Israel or Judah who are examples of, of good, positive, covenant-keeping perspective that when you get one like Jehoshaphat, we got to pause and celebrate, because this guy, he seems to be moving in the right direction, not only for himself, but because he proclaimed the fast for all of his people. You see, the best leaders or the most powerful leaders aren't the ones who just do the right things for the right reason, but they're the ones who get the most people possible to also do the right things for the right reason. I like that he gets them to fast. The word fast is like the word fastener. It's something that helps make things strong. Like we talk about a fast runner, it's a strong runner. So fasting is about getting strength from the Lord. You weaken your body in some ways so that you can get additional strength from God and let him prevail in your life. And his name, we haven't written it down, but Jehoshaphat means Jehovah will judge or deliver. So his name is an appropriate one for what they need from God. 
that God will be a deliverer. This is exactly what they need in this moment. So, turning to God, we all need this deliverance. Now, now watch what happens in verse 4. Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah. They came to seek the Lord. This is a beautiful verse in my mind of a group of people who actually sustain their leaders, not just in word but in deed as well. All the cities of Judah come together and turn to the Lord and seek him. So, notice in verse 5 it says, as Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. He didn't just get him to fast and he didn't get him to just come to Jerusalem, he got him to come to the temple. So, they've now come into the house of the Lord, this connecting point with heaven. Jehoshaphat stands up in the midst of this group and he's now going to, to speak to them. And you'll notice in verse 6 through 9, he's speaking about things that the Lord God of Israel has done in the past. So, he's shoring up the faith of the people and maybe even perhaps a little bit of his own confidence in the Lord, reminding them all of what God has done for them in the past, which that foundation of faith now becomes a ground wherein hope can spring for them. Look at verse 10 in their present, and now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Sire, whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given, to, uh, given us to inherit. And then his prayer, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do but our eyes are upon thee. I, I don't know what your Ammon and Moab and my Mount Sire armies may be, but you'll notice in life that it, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There are times when you have to face Ammon, other times when you have to face Moab, and other times when you have to face a Mount Sire or a Philistine battle, but in this case, they've, they've come together and in your life, you've probably noticed that there have been times, and maybe you're going through one right now, where it feels like all of the elements are combined against you, where nothing seems to be going well, where you are helpless, and if you're not careful, it's easy to become hopeless. But I love this example of him turning to God, saying, we are not, a there is no way we can take on these armies who are come against us, and we don't know what to do. So, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Our eyes are upon thee. I just love that phrase. We look to our solution, we don't look to our problem. It's fascinating how Jehoshaphat calls upon the memory of God's covenant to Abraham, this enduring, eternal, unbreakable covenant that God will never break. Notice back here in verse 7, Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? So Jehoshaphat is helping the people, as Tyler was saying, trust God and also pleading to God, Lord God, you made this covenant to Abraham. We are his seed. We need you now. Just like you saved our ancestors from the Egyptians, we are now in a moment where only you can save us. What's fascinating is that Jehoshaphat is t sharing truth. He's saying true things about the character of God, his covenantal nature. It turns out when you speak the truth, it builds trust. Jehoshaphat is inviting the people to trust God, and God himself is the great tree of salvation. You think about the, the tree of life that we hear about in Nephi's story, and Lehi's story. These words all come from the same root word. When you speak truth, it's trust. It's just like a tree that's immovable. It's there providing shade and nourishment. God is that tree for us. We can trust in him. We can speak those words of truth. And I see this covenantal connection that Jehoshaphat understands this. I need the people to trust God. 
And I want to remind them of the covenant he made with us to deliver us when we have called upon them. And that's exactly what we see going here, going on here, is that the people are turning to the God that they can trust in truth, and he will be their tree of salvation. Which you look at, uh, look at verse 13, where, it's, where it tells you who's actually in that group. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. I love that this, this was a family event. It wasn't just the men of each family going and representing everybody. They brought everybody. We need to combine the faith of everybody because the enemy is combined against us, and there's no way we can deliver ourselves, and we need everybody's effort turning heavenward. And even the faith of a little child is going to make a difference, it seems, for these people in this moment of, of dire need. It reminds me a bit of King Benjamin's speech where people gather as by families to listen to the words of God's chosen servant who points all of them heavenward that we're all in dire need of being saved from physical and spiritual death, far more dire than the armies of Ammon and Edom, which are the Moabites against the people of Jerusalem. So we have these similar things going on with righteous leaders who call the people together in families and have them center on the trustworthy God who lives in truth and invites us to be anchored to that tree through the iron rod that takes us there. We can partake of that fruit of salvation. All the scriptures are connected into this plan of salvation. So in the middle of this, this big gathering at the temple in Jerusalem on that day, there's a man who stands up in the midst of the group, uh, Jehaziel, and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he prophesies. Look at verse 15, and he said, Hearken ye, all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. There will be times in each of our lives where the, the Savior's voice will come to us through the, the power of the Holy Ghost whispering, be not afraid, be still, and know that I am God. Watch me do my work. It's not required for us to solve every single problem we face. doesn't mean we don't work on them, but occasionally you get a miracle like Jehoshaphat and his people, and oh, how sweet it is when these come, because verse 17 says, ye shall no, not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So, I, I don't know about you, but if I'm standing there, I'm, I'm looking at this huge multitude out there outside the city, and I'm hearing, we're not going to have to fight this. I'm scratching my head saying, I, I have no idea how this is going to work. But isn't that an amazing thing about following God's prophets, is you don't always have to understand all the whys and the wherefores. He gives you prophetic statements, and you use your agency to decide to either believe and trust and follow or not. He speaks the truth, he invites us to trust, and if we do, we are led by the iron rod to the tree of salvation. There, so even though these people aren't going to have to fight the battle, they will have to work on the battle internally in their own hearts and minds. Am I going to choose to trust God in the face of my perceived reality? What am I going to do? So. God will always allow us that agency to choose him or to turn away because of fear. It's a beautiful concept, Taylor, this idea that hmm, they actually did have to fight a battle. It just wasn't with swords and spears and arrows. It was an internal battle of, of the degree to which I'm going to engage in trusting God and following the prophet and the, the inspiration that came. So we go to verse 20, 
They rose up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And then he appoints singers and musicians, and instead of arming them with swords and weaponry, he arms them with music. It's like you sent out the choir. <laughs> now, if I was asked to be in the choir, I would definitely scare away the armies. Maybe that's the hidden part of the story that the uh, <laughs> that the scribes didn't tell us is it was so bad <laughs> that these other armies uh, finished the battle <laughs> at that point. It turns out we have this name uh, Asaph back up in verse uh, 14. That name shows up in other parts of scriptures uh, he seems to be a Levite of the tribe of Levi, appointed by David to manage the temple choir. You'll see in the Psalms, when we get to that, there are Psalms that are written by Asaph or the sons of Asaph or people who are part of that congregation. So this seems to be the professional temple choir. I mean, a bit po possibly like the, the tabernacle at Temple Square, like let's send out the very best singers. Can you imagine a massive battle going on today and we send out the Tabernacle Choir? We send out the Tabernacle choir. choir and orchestra at Temple Square to play as they go out to, to look at the battlefield. Verse 22 tells us, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sire, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten because each one of the groups thought that the others had been hired by Jehoshaphat to come and fight against them. So before you know it, the enemies are all fighting each other and they're destroying themselves. While the children of, or while the, the uh, people of the kingdom of Judah are sitting up there singing or playing their instruments or listening to the music, watching the battle unfold and be fought in front of them. You'll notice uh, at the very end of this story, verse 30, so the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest round about. For any of you who may be facing a, an army of Ammon or Moab or Mount Sire or all three of them combined at this point in your life, whatever that may look like, whatever that, that may take on, um, just know that, that storms don't last forever. Um, battles like this don't rage forever and there comes a time when this war ended and there will come a time when your battles will, will pass. Uh, maybe not permanently in this life, maybe for some of you it won't be until the next, but they will pass and ultimately it's if you put your trust in he who is embodied by that tree of life, if our trust is put in Jesus Christ and as a reminder, go back to the very beginning to their prayer neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. I think if Jehoshaphat were standing here as a guest today, I think that might be his message to us in the latter days is look up, look to your solution, and yes, it looks like you're going to be destroyed, but trust in God. And if you put him first and if you trust in him, what is it President Howard W. Hunter used to say? Nothing will permanently go wrong if you keep your faith in God. And that's a, that's a powerful covenantal promise that he gives us, that if we'll stay his people and treat him like a people should treat a God, then he will be our God. And as long as he's our God, nothing can permanently go wrong. Doesn't mean we're not going to have some pretty scary battles, but we're going we're gonna to be okay in the end. Tie this back into creation, this, this word, they found rest round about. The Sabbath is a time of rest. The creation story, one of the lessons we get is that God rested from his efforts to establish order where there had been chaos. War is a form of chaos. Our suffering and challenges are forms of chaos. So the Sabbath day symbolizes for us what life can be with God. The temple also is the physical embodiment of Sabbath. So when ancient temples were built, it was to symbolize that God has established his earthly throne with the king and there's rest round about and that the temple 
now represents that there is rest. So we can think to ourselves, I have a weekly opportunity to experience rest. I can go to the temple and experience this rest. Even if we don't have immediate rest roundabout, maybe we haven't yet reached that pinnacle that Alma even dreamed about where he wanted to have rest in God's kingdom, but he could not yet rest in this life because there's still so much good work to be done. I love this phrase, rest roundabout. That's ultimately the promise that God has for all of us. And even if we don't have it fully in this life, we can get it in doses on a weekly basis, the Sabbath day, or in our temple, or really in our own places of uh, sanctity that we create for ourselves so we can have time with God. Beautiful reminder. Now, we just had to share that one story from Second Chronicles, and there are others in there, but that's one that often gets skipped, so I um, thought it was worth, uh, worth bringing up. Now we jump into Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, in our oldest versions of the, the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, Ezra and Nehemiah are, are one, one work, one book. We've since separated them out, but there are actually th um, three major groups who are going to come into these stories between Ezra and Nehemiah. So to fill you in in the timeline, keep in mind, let's just let's just do a timeline coming down this way. 600 BC, in Jerusalem you get Lehi and you get Jeremiah and other prophets making all of these prophecies about if you don't repent, Babylon's going to come and, and carry away captive and destroy our city and kill many of you. And many of the people felt like, you guys are weakening the strength of the city. We should just trust in these mighty walls of Jerusalem and in our arms, and it didn't work. And we have the temple here, and they believe that as long as we've got the temple here, we've got the presence of God on our side, nobody can overthrow us. We're good. You, you guys must be the evil ones. Yeah, it is a little sad that they had missed the purpose of the temple. It was a sign that God's presence was with them, but they believed, well, if God's presence is here, all is good. We'll just let God fight our battles. We see that God will fight battles if you choose to look if to you, him if you turn and to listen him. to God's chosen servants, like Jehoshaphat was. If you say, I'm going to let God fight my battles, but I'm not going to listen to him, um, you're going to find yourself in battle with God. <laughs> so that, that's kind of what happened there. Then the problems really start kicking into gear in 597, with Jehoiakim and the, the leadership of, of Jerusalem. The king of Babylon comes, carries him away with the first wave, and then they put uh, Zedekiah on the throne, kind of a puppet king. Yeah, the Babylonians want a king in Judah that will take orders from Babylon and to make sure that the tax dollars are flowing back to Babylon. That's right. So when Zedekiah m tries to make an alliance with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, who are kind of the dynasty of the past, and they're they're past their prime as far as military dominance. Well, that makes Nebuchadnezzar pretty upset, so he comes in, wipes out the city. That's about 587, 586 BC, when we then carry them captive finally into Babylon and wreck the city. I mean, the destruction layer is significant. Archaeologists have gone in and seen massive ash layers and homes torn down, and we've actually discovered some amazing things. For example, the scribe of Jeremiah, we have found um, his, his signet ring that he used to seal documents. A lot of really incredible discoveries, but just very sad to realize that all these people who had trusted in the strength of the cities did not trust in the source of that strength, which was God. And God's like, you know what? I've given you all these opportunities. You guys have broken the rules and the laws of this homeland. So therefore, I'm going to let you go into another land, and you can go hang out with those fake gods for a while and see how that works out for you. <laughs> so here we are in Babylonian exile. And that's where we're going to pick up some other stories down the road with, with Daniel. Um, Ezekiel is going to be out with that first wave that, that was taken out of Jerusalem at the, out on the river um, in Babylon. So we'll pick up some of those st stories later on in the year. Well, fast forward now to our, our timeline for today's lesson, which is Ezra-Nehemiah. So 
in 539, 538, in the 530s, then Persia comes to town and destroys the kingdom of Babylon. So all of these Israelites have been taken out of their home, taken to the east, into Babylon. Now Persia comes from northern, the northern part of that region in Mesopotamia, comes down, overthrows Babylon. Um, Persia is combined later on with Media. Yeah, it's kind of a combined force coming out of the Iranian plateau, and it's, this becomes a pivot point in world history. It impacts the Bible, but a lot of other things happen in world history because of this. We'll talk about a few of those points. So keep in mind, the, the king here, he's very, he, he kind of stands out, not just in our biblical record, but in our ancient history record in general. This guy, Cyrus, the king of Persia, he is a king unlike almost any other of the, of the world's dynasties, uh, monarchs. He, he has a totally different approach. Instead of coming up and ruling with, with a heavy, heavy hand or using terror tactics, Cyrus does quite the opposite. He, he wins people over by actually serving them and finding out what they, what they would like and trying to meet those needs. It's, it's quite refreshing. Ironically, he's, he's the only one in our Old Testament to get the official title of a Mashiach, or a Messiah, an anointed one, almost as if to say God anointed him for this role to be able to help the house of Israel, and not just the house of Israel, but many other conquered kingdoms as well, but our focus in the, in the biblical account is on the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin who have been carried away captive and others with them. So he, be, he literally becomes a savior for them, a Messiah figure to send them back into Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. And keep in mind, if you look at the dates here, from 586 down to the 530s, you actually have a group of people who return to Jerusalem who remember the glory days when the temple, before the temple had been destroyed. And so they're going to come into the story here a little bit later, and they, they can do some comparison here. But what an amazing thing that the Lord can use people who are not in the covenant with him to still do covenantal things for his work to move forward anyway. He's a Gentile. This is exactly your point. God chose a Gentile, calls him a Messiah in Isaiah, to deliver his people. So Persia is where modern-day Iran is today, so one of the world's great empires. In fact, Iran has had at least three of the world's great empires across human history. It turns out that many of the people in Babylon didn't really like their leaders. The leaders were oppressive and it turns out that when Cyrus came, it was in some ways a deliverance even of the Babylonian people from their overlords in Babylon who were just extracting wealth and resources and living and, and having the people live in terror. I also want to point out, as Tyler was saying, there's about a 50-year gap here. 50 years is a long time. That's almost two full generations. So you imagine now the Jews have been living in Mesopotamia, right in the middle of these two major rivers, Euphrates and the Tiger Tigris River, and many of them have settled down. We've since archaeologically discovered a lot of documents from this time period. Uh, there were Jews that were running banks in Babylon. They're taking on Babylonian names. You'll see that in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and they basically have decided, all right, well, we're here. We are going to they're still practicing being good Israelites, but they've integrated themselves into much of the culture and the language to the point that when the Jews are allowed the opportunity to return, scholarship suggests maybe only about 10% of the Jews actually return to Jerusalem. And fascinating fact, it was only with the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948 that the Jewish community that had been in Iraq or Babylon since almost 600 BC, started to fully return. The longest standing and wealthiest community and often the best educated community of Jews across most of history 
was the group in Babylon that was there from about 600 BC all the way until just about 70 years ago. Is that fascinating? Mm -hmm. So 2,600 years that they had stayed there, and then finally with the state of Israel, they're like, okay, it's time to return. Mm -hmm. So again, only maybe 10, 10 or 15% returned here in the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. So for those of you who want that reference to where Cyrus is called a Messiah by Isaiah, it's uh, in chapter 45, verse 1 of Isaiah, where, where you get that reference. And um, by the way, keep in mind, Cyrus, we, we told you what an amazing leader he is. He ends up building the biggest world empire that we know of up to that point in the history of the world. He, he goes from the Indus River clear out to the Mediterranean, he never quite gets down into Africa, but his domain, his kingdom Even is, portions of Egypt is huge. Eventually got taken. We probably should point out that he declares religious freedom. That's right. And there's something called the Cyrus Cylinder that archaeologists have discovered. A copy of it is now in the UN building in New York. And it's the oldest document we have from the ancient world where we have essentially religious freedom declared. Again, as Tyler's pointing out, Cyrus realizes, huh, if I am respectful to all these different religious groups and encourage them to worship as they see fit, my guess is they'll be more likely to be loyal to me and to pay their taxes. And it turns out he was right. He was right. And so the United Nations seeing this as a powerful example of good leadership has that document among many others uh, at the United Nations as a reminder that when we live in a very a global world with lots of lots of nations and religions, we have to find ways to live in peace with one another. And Cyrus, one of God's anointed, modeled for us one way to do that is to be respectful for other people and even encourage people to to be involved in their religion to the point that Cyrus takes this wealth that the Babylonians acquired and he hands it back to the people that had been stolen from. So he gets all this wealth that had been stolen from the Jerusalem temple and says to the Jews, here's all this wealth back. How about you guys go back and worship God? I think that you guys will be better citizens if you take this wealth, rebuild your temple, and stay covenantally connected to God. And I think I would hope that I could live my life in such a way that whoever I interact with, that I could empower them with resources to be loyal and connected to God, however that might work for them. So as a quick overview, Cyrus, uh, his death date is, is contested as to when he actually dies, but it's somewhere around 530, so shortly, not, not a long time after taking over Babylon. But the overview of Ezra and Nehemiah consists of three major groups, and there's a lot going on here, but for the most part, you have him sending Zerubbabel back, then you have... A good Babylonian name. A good name from Babylon. Literally means born in Babylon. And then we have Nehemiah, who's going to go back to build the walls. So this is why we often call the temple the second building of the temple, because the first one was Solomon, and the second one is often referred to as Zerubbabel's temple. And so he's going to help build the, the altar and the temple. Ezra's there to help with some of that effort, and then later on, uh, so he's going to bring back a lot of the gold and silver and the precious things to put into the temple, and then Nehemiah is going to rebuild the walls and the gates. So that's, that's kind of your overview of where we are. And then in next week's lesson, we're going to talk about Esther, who is in the palace at Shushan, up in Media, the capital. So it's, it's, she is the last of our books in the history portion of the Bible. So we'll get that lesson next week with the story of Esther. So let's jump into chapter one of Ezra, where you get introduced to Cyrus here, this king, and it says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also into writing. So you'll notice that the Lord is doing his work once again through a non-Israelite. He's not in the covenant family. 
but it doesn't stop God from having this, this powerful connection with him. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of he heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build up, build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. <laughs> I love that. The Lord has told me I need to build up a house to him, a temple in Judah, in Jerusalem. And so he then asks the question, who's among you of all of his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let him, uh, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with, with goods and with beasts. Basically, he's saying, I have no idea how to build your temple. Is there anybody in this group who knows what they're doing? I will, I will help you, and you can gather all the resources you need, and we'll help you make this happen. And as Taylor mentioned, most of the people by this time, 50 years after being taken away from Jerusalem, they're saying, no, actually, I kind of like my, my new home, maybe my farm or my, my surroundings, whatever I'm, I'm living in here in, in Babylonian exile. I'm comfortable. I, I don't, there's a lot of work to do back in Jerusalem. Babylon is extremely wealthy. It's well watered, incredible farmland. It's diverse. That all the goods of the world there, all the trade routes go through. And if you look at where Jerusalem is, it's off the major trade routes. It's not really close to anything. And the walls are destroyed. You have to lug everything up 3,000 feet at the mountainside to, to get the resources in. It's a lot of work. So people became very comfortable living in Babylon versus let's go out into the wilderness, let's go through the wilderness and get up to Jerusalem and have this enormous work of not just building the temple, but building city walls is an enormous undertaking. Uh, I've been to Israel, and some of these city walls are just massive. And I think about just trying to put a fence around my house and the, like how, how little effort I really want to put in to get it done. So we don't really know all the motivations of why some Jews went back and some stayed in Babylon, but it's significant that good leaders build houses dedicated to God. It's fascinating that Cyrus does this, but we see that Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, when they come into power, they want to build a temple, like King David wanted to do, eventually Solomon did. I think what's going on today, we have leaders who are building temples to God. Across human history, people dedicated to God, particularly leaders, marshal resources and people to build temples to God. And in some ways, I see that as one of the major themes of Ezra and Nehemiah. How do we build a temple to our God in the face of our poverty, of opposition, internal strife? How do we do God's work when things are very difficult? Which, by the way, today you'll notice the, the prophet isn't asking us to put on our hard hats and get our shovels and picks and, and hammers and go and build temples. It's all taken care of for us. All of this, this heavy labor that these people had to do back then, that's all done. Now what our prophets are asking us to do is to maybe step away from our Babylons of prosperity with matters of time and resources to be able to spend some time sacrificing for the Lord and for, for our loved ones on, on the other side of the veil, as well as on this side of the veil, in serving in the temple. Maybe not to build the temple, but to build a temple of testimony inside of us. So it's, it's a slightly different uh, sacrifice needing to be made, but it is a sacrifice nonetheless. So you'll notice that some people step forward, some chiefs of the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and they, they volunteer and they get the gold and the silver and the beasts and all the precious things to go. And then verse 7 tells you that Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of Jerusalem out of the temple, and he returns it all. These are like trophies. In the ancient world, if a people were conquered, one of the signs that they had been conquered was that their, their religious symbols would be put in the temple of the gods of the conquering army. These were trophies trophies to show that your group that is now lost has to submit to us. And here, Cyrus, instead of dominating and say, look, I have all your sacred elements in my holy house to whatever God I'm worshiping, he's saying, I am giving you back all of your sacred things so you can build back to God. Really 
just so interesting that Cyrus, this Gentile, he is in tune enough with the Spirit of God. He realizes if you want to build a peaceful and prosperous society, you center on God, you love God, and you love your neighbor. And Cyrus did this. He loved people not to say, I'm going to support you guys in flourishing in the ways that will help draw you closer to God. So chapter 2 is a chapter that is filled with lots and lots of names, dozens of people. And don't you listed, need to have them all memorized? And, and you to need get... to memorize those for the final exam at the end of this year. Just well, I thought you meant the final exam just into, just kidding. into the next life. Yeah, if you'll know you're in trouble if you come up to the proverbial pretty gates and, and St. Peter says, good, you passed all of the, the tests of mortality, there's only one more question, one more question. <laughs> and if you can pass it, then you get in. <laughs> Name ten of the people mentioned in Ezra chapter two. <laughs> That's a bad day <laughs> if that happens. If to it's us. an open book test, that there you might go. Help. Then we're good. Then and we're if you good. can search it on like a phone, that might help too. And we're—I don't know that you get coverage up there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to point out one little thing here um, that sometimes could get buried and lost in this long list of names, because you see, for us. It's just a long list of names. It's boring. But for the people back then, it wasn't just a list of names. It was a list of their ancestors. This is family history for them, and they're going to build a temple, and they're listing their genealogies and their pedigrees. That is, that is their identity. It's not just showing a, a four-generation sheet. It's it's where they get their feeling of existence, is in this tribal connection, in the, I have a place in this family, and they can list off all these ancestors and all these people that they're associated with, and they get great uh, uh, uni unification from that experience. Well, look what happens in verse 61. And of the children of the priests, the children of Habaya, and the children of Koz, and the children of uh, Barzillai, and I'm probably just butchering all of those names, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. So here's a group of people who married outside of the covenant. Watch what happens. These sought their register among those that, they, that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they, as polluted, put from the priesthood. To those people back then, that was a big, big deal. And if if you didn't have that connection to this family and this long list of names that seems so boring to us, it was grounds for removing the priesthood from them, and they were not allowed to participate in the building up of the temple because they didn't they didn't have that connection because of marriages that had been performed outside of the house of Israel. That really strict commandment from Deuteronomy chapter seven to not marry outside of the covenant. Now you come to chapter 3, and here's where you get the name of Zerubbabel mentioned, chapter 3, verse 2. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brother and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. It's interesting, we put all the emphasis on Zerubbabel, but the reality is, is Jeshua is He's mentioned just as much, but for some reason we give all of the title to that temple to Zerubbabel. The irony here is the name Jeshua or Yeshua is actually the name, the common tongue name that you would use when referring to Jesus in his day. That was his name. It wasn't Jesus. That's an English name, a translation. His real name is Yeshua or in the Old Testament English version, it would be Joshua or Yehoshua, but it's kind of cool that the, the name equivalent of Jesus Christ is there helping to build this temple with Zerubbabel. Hmm. I wonder if there's any symbolism for you and me being in the place of Zerubbabel and needing help building these sacred spaces today, and we have Yeshua to help us through this process. Of building. And so the very first thing that they build up, verse 3, is the altar. And they put the altar there so they can start performing these sacrifices again in this sacred space. But you'll notice they're scared because it's not like Jerusalem was just empty for 50 years after they got destroyed and carried away captive. 
vacuums like to get filled, and Jerusalem got filled, but people haven't rebuilt the city or the temple, but there are a lot of people living in that region, not just in the, the destroyed city area, but in all the regions around about. So they're building this up knowing at any point we're kind of vulnerable here, and we could be destroyed. So they start keeping these feasts, like Feast of the Tabernacles, and um, the Sabbaths, their, the new moons, all of those traditions, and you jump down to verse 12, and it says, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. Mm -hmm. So the ones who had never seen the old temple of Solomon, the, the, the new generation, they're all shouting for joy. This is awesome. This is wonderful. We've got to, we're, we're rebuilding the temple, but the older generation that had known the first one, they weren't shouting for joy. They were weeping for joy to see, even though it's not in the same splendor as Solomon's, I, I think there's this, uh, this gratitude of seeing that, okay, we're, we're going to, to have our, our temple rebuilt after all. So, at this point, as you're reading in scriptures, wouldn't you love it if the scriptures then said, and it came to pass that because they were people who were trying really hard to keep the law of Moses, they're, they're trusting in the Lord, they're working really hard, that everything just prospered and it just worked out beautifully and smooth sailing from here on out until they built the temple, consecrated and dedicated it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? There wouldn't be a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah, then, then the whole book of the rest of Ezra and Nehemiah wouldn't exist, because as you realize, living in a fallen world, just because you're trying really hard to do good things doesn't mean that everything automatically just works out perfectly for you. Sometimes there's an intense opposition that is raised, and you see that opposition in chapter 4 begin. And this isn't the, the end, this is just the beginning of the opposing for forces. So verse 1 says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esar Haddon, king of As uh, uh, Asur which is Assyria. Assyria, which brought us up hither. So, he brought us into this land. This land, it's the God of Israel. That's who we worship here, so we want to help you. Yeah, you might remember when the Assyrians conquered the ten northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel, they depopulated the ten northern tribes area and repopulated it with people from all over the Assyrian Empire, and those people eventually become known as the Samaritans. And in fact, in the story, uh, the, the people who are living, these people have been populated now in the land of Israel, had to learn how to worship the God of the land, and a couple of priests were sent back from captivity to teach them. So now we're a couple hundred years later, these people say, gosh, we should have full access to these things. And the leaders in Judah and Jerusalem aren't certain who are these people, are they truly part of this tribe of God, and can we trust their intentions? So we have th this challenge going on of are these legitimate worshipers of God, or are they trying to hijack the uh, efforts that are going on, on here? And again, kind of like the Babylonian exile and people coming back, same thing applies to that Assyrian conquest. In, in certain parts of the biblical narrative, it makes it sound like Assyria just totally wiped out the entire population of Israelites in that northern kingdom and carried them all captive away and brought other brand new people in and then brought a few priests in. In other places, and in a lot of rabbinical traditions among the Jews, the belief is that the majority of the people were left, some of the nobles and the rich and the elite were carried away, the rulers, the people who had the, the power to drive the masses, they're all taken away, and then some of the others as well, but there's a good portion left, but they're not the ruling class and they're not Levites, they don't, they, they haven't been performing priestly functions, and now they're all intermarried, but you can see how they would say, but hey, Lord God of Israel, I'm, I'm part Israel and I want to worship with you, 
and Zerubbabel and Yeshua are saying, no, you're not going to help us build this temple. And so what happens is this group then conspires against them and they write a letter to the king and tell him, do you know what you're doing? Have you not read your history book? Jerusalem is a really disobedient city, and if you let them rebuild their temple, they're going to stop paying taxes to you, and they're going to to rise up in rebellion all the time, and you're going to have a big headache on your hands, just so you know. So the king gets this letter, has the chronicles read to him, and realizes, yeah, this city keeps showing up as a problem, so he sends a cease and desist order to the builders of the temple. I wonder if that's ever happened to you, where you've been engaged in a great work moving forward, and it's going really well, and you're so excited, and people are rejoicing to see the progress, and then something rises up to tell you, stop, you can't keep going any further. And that can happen in family settings, in, in church settings, in, in school settings, in, in vocational settings in yeah. your career, in a variety of ways where all of a sudden you can be left with no recourse, nothing, nothing you can do to change the, the mind of this order of the king. Notice what happens in chapter 5. You get introduced to Haggai and Zechariah. We're going to talk about them in greater detail near the end of the Old Testament year when we get to their books. Verse 1 says, the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel even unto them. So two prophets rise up and prophesy in the name of God, at which point you notice it says that Zerubbabel and Jeshua began to build the house of God. So they start building again. In the face of this this cease and desist order from the king of Persia, they say, we're going to be fine. And so then you get the governor coming to them and asking, who gave you this authority? Why are you still doing this? And look at verse 5, but the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. And then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. So their rebuttal, their, their appeal, is to say, hey, we were told by the king. King Cyrus was the one who gave us this order to come, so we're just following his order. And they also talk about, we're also doing what God commanded our ancestors to do, and they even talk about how their ancestors had been rebellious against their own God. Now, it's interesting, the ancient, ancient Near Eastern kings would understand, huh, if you're rebellious to your own God, that God's probably going to kick you out of the land. So the, the, these Israelites are making a really strong claim, we had this happen to us, the Babylonians took us into captivity because of our unfaithfulness to God, but Cyrus has delivered us, almost like Moses, and sent us back to build the temple, so we are under command of your first king as well as the command of God. And they were hopeful the Persian king would get it on both the political and the religious level that this was an okay thing, that it was actually legitimate and should be done. So at the very end of chapter 5 and verse 17, they, they make a search among all of the decrees of Cyrus, and they find his decree to rebuild this house. So they say, okay, well, we're not going to overturn Cyrus, uh, even though he's, he's um, not around anymore. I know sometimes we like to say negative things about bureaucracies, I think it's interesting here, the amount of record keeping that had gone on with unnamed scribes who had toiled in, um, in obscurity to document all these things that are going on so that leaders who appear to be trying to take the time to understand what really is going on can get the full context of a story. And I find this story helpful that if I'm ever in a position where I need to be making decisions on behalf of other people, that I should get as many facts, as all the facts possible. It's interesting that if we want to think well, we have to have good data and good thinking patterns about that data. And I like that this Gentile Persian king is taking the time to gather good data and apply good thinking to the data so you can have righteous decisions being made. 
So, a new letter is drafted and sent, and you come over to chapter 6, and they, they receive this letter. Look at verse uh, 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which is the sixth month of the reign of Darius, Darius the king. So, they finished it. It's good. We're there. Now, go over to chapter 7. You're introduced to Ezra, the scribe, for whom this book is named. In verse 6 it says, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him." Well, here's, here's the fascinating thing. So, Ezra is given this, this command. He's, he's over in, in Persia. Now you go back and take all of these additional precious things, lots and lots of gold and silver and instruments and everything to beautify the temple, and take it with you. Well, there's a little bit of a problem. You're traveling through one of the most um, dangerous regions of the world for, for a caravan of people with a lot of gold and silver. This isn't the road you want to be on without an army protecting you. And you'll notice that chapter 8 tells you in verse 21, they have a problem. Then I proclaimed, this is Ezra, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So here's Ezra saying, we've got all of this really, really expensive stuff, and I don't, I don't dare ask the king for, for deliverance here. So he turned to his real king for deliverance. Because he had testified to the earthly Persian king I don't really need your arm of flesh strength because I have God to be with me. And we should make it clear, God encourages us to make use of the resources he has made available to provide physical nourishment and sustenance, at the same time not forgetting where they come from, where all these resources come from. So I love Ezra's faith that he has proclaimed his strong testimony, God will deliver us. And then he gets to a point, he's like, Okay, maybe my testimony meeting was a belief, but I am now in a situation where I have to be tested and truly get a testimony that God will deliver, which he does. He said these little stories, these little nuggets packed in the scriptures, and sometimes I wish the Bibles were printed with nice little bookmarks you just pull out and say, here's a fabulous story about how to trust God when life seems to be conspired against you. Yeah, this is a this is a beautiful play on words. That, that this becomes a test of their testimony because he he's he's been given that testimony, but now it really does get put to the test. And I think God does the same thing with us today in a variety of ways, where we can make bold statements of what we believe, and then it's almost as if the Lord puts us in situations to say, "Now show yourself that you really believe." because we don't need to prove anything to God. God already knows everything about us, past, present, and future. It's us that we need to learn about our devoted connection with him, and that's what happens here. So, he separates it out among all this group of people. They weigh it so that when they get to Jerusalem, they can reweigh it to make sure that nothing's been lost or stolen or nothing's happened to it, and all of it arrives safely into Jerusalem. It's a beautiful solution that he found to give it to these priests so they don't look like merchants, they don't look like there's anything really fancy to be uh, stealing from them, and they arrive, and then there's an issue there at the end of Ezra where they intermarry with, with some non-Israelites, and Ezra tries to, to clean that situation up, and he does in that very last chapter. And again, culturally, things were done differently back then, and back then, 
who was part of your tribe was crucial. And at that time, it was about being within the tribe of Israel and not spreading out around. God was not sending the Israelites out at this point to do missionary work and to have them intermarry with the peoples of the world. Now, the world has changed. We do those things now. We send out missionaries everywhere, and we are involved with more people around the world. But back then, God made it really clear, I expect you guys at this point to stay within the tribe. So we've mentioned Ezra the scribe briefly, and I want to remind us that there's several key important individuals that show up in the biblical text. You have prophets, we had those mentioned in Nehemiah, and kings and priests. All of them play an important role in reminding people and pointing them to the covenant that God offered the people at Mount Sinai, at the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses, where God reveals, here are my covenantal instructions for you to be faithful to me, to be loyal to me, to show trust in me. So prophets had a role in reminding people. King, the king's job was also to protect the people so they could live the covenant. Priests also helped people with the rituals related to the covenant. Well, this is the first time we really have this new role in the Old Testament, the scribe. And Ezra is put foremost in this part of the Old Testament as a key character. And why? Because he has mastered the law of Moses. He has mastered from scripture study and living the law, and he can teach it to other people. You might remember in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, God lays out his expectations for kingships, that a good king should have the law written, that the king should read it regularly, live it, and teach it to people. We see Nephi was a scribe. He made sure he had the record. He wrote it down, he preserved it, and he taught it to people. So we see this theme already happening in the Old Testament, but now with Ezra, it really comes to the forefront that with the record, with God's covenantal law written, you can have a teacher in Israel who tells people, here's what God expects. And we'll see that Ezra engages in the covenantal renewal ceremony at the temple and reminds people, reading from the law of Moses, the covenantal instructions, how they should be living and being faithful to God, that they should learn from their ancestors who got kicked out of the land for not living God's Torah, God's covenantal instructions. We see the same theme in the Book of Mormon. You have prophets like King Benjamin and Abinadi, Mosiah, others who are teaching the covenantal instructions saying, if you want to preserve in peace and prosperity in the land, you have to keep the commandments. Well, how can you keep the commandments if you don't know what they are? That's why a scribe matters. So definitely prophets, kings, and priests matter. But it's interesting, as Israelite history transitions over time, we find fewer and fewer prophets, but we get more of the scribal tradition where you have learned people, faithful to God, who have mastered the scriptures and can teach the covenantal instructions to other people. So we, we have these four major characters all related to bringing the covenants. So by the time Jesus comes onto the scene in the New Testament, the word scribe or scribes, you understand those are the literate people who, who often refer to as the lawyers because they know the law. Unfortunately, by that time, they now start taking on Jesus and attacking him. So he'll Jesus will often refer to the Pharisees and the scribes often in his rebuke in the same breath as in the case of Matthew 23 and other places as well. It's a little bit like Abinadi taking on the priests of Noah, who the priests of Noah claim that they understand what the law is, but they're not, they might be even teaching it to people, but they're not living it. And this is part of one of Jesus' complaints. It's like, it's not enough to know what it says. You have to interpret it righteously and to actually live it. And there seems to be those issues going on in Jesus' day that some people who knew the scriptures were not really righteously interpreting them and themselves weren't living them. They were like, oh, it's good enough to teach to other people to live it, but I'm not going to do it myself. So let's transition now to Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes into the story last. He's over in the palace in Shushan where Esther is going to find her story in our next, uh, uh, next episode, as we've already mentioned. You'll notice how it starts. 
he's in the palace in chapter 1 verse 1, and he finds out what's going in on in Jerusalem and how they had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and, and concerning all this rebuilding effort, and notice it says in verse 4, it came to pass that when I heard these words, that the words in verse 3 are that the walls are broken down and the gates are ruined and the city's not protected, even though now they've rebuilt the temple, he sat down and wept, and he mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and he pleads with God for help. We don't know anything else about this guy other than Nehemiah starts in the palace in Shushan and he's serving the king. I love what he says in verse 5, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God. Now, we think the word terrible means nasty or awful, but terrible is more of like his grandiose nature. He's so far beyond what most humans can even comprehend. It's like, I, I can't even imagine, but it meant in a good way, that keepeth covenant and mercy. Sometimes people think the Old Testament is about a mean, jealous, angry, capricious God. There is a theme throughout the Old Testament, if you look carefully, God is covenantally and eternally merciful and benevolent. Nehemiah knows that. He is calling upon the enduring, unbreakable nature of God, his hesed, his covenantal mercy. And Nehemiah is saying, God has covenantally connected to us, why is Jerusalem not yet built? He's even asking God, remember your covenant to our ancestors, please deliver us. And we too could do the same as being tied in this covenant. We can call upon God because he is trustworthy. He will fulfill the eternal covenants that he's made to his people. So, watch what happens in chapter 2. He's serving wine to the king, King Artaxerxes, and the king asks him, why, why are you so sad? It, it's almost as if his role is he's a butler to the king or a servant to the king and he's, he's serving wine. But it's actually important. In the ancient world, a king doesn't want to get poisoned, so one of the most important and trustworthy roles is the person who serves you food. Because often the butler or the wine server had to taste things in advance. Because in order to stop a coup or a takeover, you would have to protect the food sources for the king. And so a guy like Nehemiah would be the first to die from poison. So he himself has to ensure that what the king is getting is absolutely trustworthy. So it means that the Persian king sees Nehemiah as one of the most trustworthy people in his entire kingdom that stretches from, well, basically Greece all the way into India. So the king says, you're sad because these walls aren't rebuilt? Tell you what, how long do you think it'll take you to do this? So he gives him an estimate of how long he thinks it'll take to travel, rebuild them, and then get back. And he says, all right, go. So Nehemiah begins this same journey. Are you noticing all these different groups of people going to great lengths to go to build up the city and house of the Lord in their day. Um, I love that analogy of what, what is my discipleship costing me today? What am I having to give up or sacrifice to the Lord in order to try to build up the kingdom of God on the earth today? Uh, so he arrives there and you're introduced in verse 10 to two characters that are going to, that are going to keep coming up in the story, Sanballat and Tobiah, and he, he goes by night to spy, Nehemiah does, to see what the state of the city is and all of the, the different uh, opposing forces, what they may be, and you then get to chapter 3 and he walks you through the various gates of the city. And so he's, he's basically assessing the need. So he, before he starts building, he wants to figure out what, what is this project going to entail? And I think there's a powerful principle there of, of not just jumping in, but getting a pretty good idea of what this is going to entail and then making a plan and starting. Then you come over to chapter 4. This is where things start to, to get interesting. 
So when Sanballat in verse 1 heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and he took great indignation and mocked the Jews. So again, opposition, trying to make fun of you, trying to discourage you from doing a good thing. Look at verse 8. All these different groups of people conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Notice the first word of verse 9, nevertheless. In spite of what happened in verse 8, put always the greater or nevertheless emphasis on what comes in verse 9. We made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. So now you get two forces, the builders and the guards, the people who are vigilant and watching for these we have opposing the same forces. Thing in, in church history, where you have the early saints building the temple under duress, well, at least they have duress from their enemies, they're in their poverty, and they're having to have a trowel in one hand to build the temple and, and their weapon in the other one to protect themselves from enemies who would want to physically hurt them and destroy the temple. You know, temples are this pivot point that get us in connection with God. You'd think that God would say, I really want my people to be completely connected to me, and so I'm just going to pave the path, make it totally simple, they can just build the temple and all is good. And there's so much effort that can go into building places of spiritual security. So it's not just physical buildings, but even in our own lives today, how much effort does it take to build a space of, of spiritual security with God in the face of distractions from social media, news, war, rumors of wars, rumors of rumors of wars? There's so much that tries to take our attention away from God. And what we see in these stories is people who put their trust in God and work hard and use all their resources in the work of God will be blessed to succeed. So look at what uh, Nehemiah says to the rulers of the people in verse 14. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Sounds a little bit like the uh, title of liberty mm -hmm. in that regard. So in verse 16 is where we get this description of the divided force. Half of the servants were working, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the, and the bows, and the habergeons. Nice footnote down there tells you that it's an armor of tough leather, probably, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. So we're now still building this. Look at verse 19. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place thereof ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. You'll notice the faith here, God will fight for us, but we're still, like Taylor's been saying, we're still going to do everything we can that's in our power to not just protect us, but, but to make this work go forward. We're not going to to relax and say, well, we're building this for God, so God's going to have to fight our battle. We should make this clear, because there are times God says, I want you to stand back and watch my salvation. We saw that earlier in the lesson. But usually, God wants us all in. He wants us using all of our best resources to show a consecrated, trusted effort that God has given us these blessings to help affect positive means and that we trust God as we labor in our own salvation with him saving us. So it's an important thing, because I, I do know people sometimes say, well, if God's in charge, he'll take care of everything. Well, he can. But there's a lot of perspiration that <laughs> accompanies uh, the effort of being saved. So as we, as we jump over to chapter 6, it, it starts by saying, now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem and all these others and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, but at that time there were no doors yet, the gates of the city weren't repaired, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me saying, come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plains of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. I love the, the way this comes to us in our English translation. They wanted him to come down and meet them in one of these villages in the plains of Ono, and the answer from Nehemiah is, oh no, I'm not going to come down to meet you there. Look at this next line. 
I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Uh, you're probably familiar with that character, Lahontai, in the Book of Mormon, who's up in the place of arms, Oneida, who Amalekiah kept enticing to come down, just come down and have a talk, and it didn't work three times, so the fourth time he said, just come out a little bit, bring your guards with you, I just want to have a conversation with you, and then that led to him being poisoned and killed and destroyed. I love Nehemiah for this one verse, I will not come down because I'm doing a great work. I love these stories that show the faithfulness of these ancient Jews who, against the odds, have left these prosperous, powerful nations of, of, of Persia and the area of Babylon that have been taken over by Persia, and they return home to build the temple of God and to build the walls of Jerusalem, to build a home base for themselves. Turn to chapter 8, and this is where we have Ezra, the scribe, takes the time to teach people the covenant. Now, perhaps the people had learned about God's covenant that had been given to their ancestors at Mount Sinai. Perhaps they'd been taught to them in synagogues in Babylon or elsewhere. We don't really know, but I think it's significant that in order to inaugurate this new time period, this new kingdom of the Jews with their temple in Jerusalem, that a center on God's written word is covenantal love expressed to them that the people can know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is always trustworthy, and he will always fulfill his covenants to people if they keep the commandments. But you cannot keep the commandments unless you know them. So Ezra takes the time to teach the people. And I hear echoes of King Benjamin's speech, or even Abinadi preaching to the priests of Noah, who should have been preaching to the people how to know what the commandments are so you could keep them. We today, we have prophets who teach us God's covenantal law and instructions that we might know the commandments so we can be faithful to God, that we might prosper in the land. So sometimes we look at these stories, they feel like they happened a long time ago to people in very different cultures, and sometimes it might feel hard to relate. But at a minimum, we can say to ourselves, I can learn like these people did to trust God, to listen to chosen servants who teach me words of truth. And I can learn to live those words so I can feel and see God's hand in my life. So as we conclude today, whether your opposing force looks like the Ammonites combined with the Moabites and Mount Sire, or if it looks like Sanballat and Tobiah, or if it looks like a, a group of Samaritans coming to try to prevent you from from continuing your work forward. I think the message of all of the these uh, story characters to us would be, be not afraid. Look heavenward. Trust that God is in his heavens, and even though you're facing opposition, maybe your battle is going to be an internal uh, faith struggle, and maybe your battle is going to be a very outward physical struggle, but either way, if you put the Lord God of Israel first in your life, nothing will permanently go wrong, to re-quote President Hunter there. In, uh, in closing, when you're invited to stop doing good things, your answer is, I cannot come down, for I am doing a great work. And that's the work of gathering Israel on both sides of the veil and following the prophets and hearing him as he speaks to us, and we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness.